This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of WrestleNomics Radio. I'm Brandon Thurston, broadcasting on demand from Buffalo, New York, and today is Sunday, January 10th, 2020. Last week, I broadcasted for the first time on a Saturday, and today, another first broadcasting for the first time on a Sunday. A lot of New Japan Pro Wrestling to talk about following Wrestle Kingdom 15. New Japan Pro Wrestling might have a new media partner in the near future. New Japan does have a media partner in India. New Japan does have a mobile game coming out. And the latest news about Major League Baseball's TV rights fees negotiations might tell us something about the outlook of future wrestling media rights fees. Oliver Luck has been countersued by Vince McMahon. The WWE India show appears to be on its way. There's FEC records to look at, the latest on Linda McMahon's dispersal of various funds to various friends, but mainly just one. All that coming up. But first... First, a pro wrestling television viewership update. The big lead this week, WWE Raw, pulled its biggest audience since WrestleMania for a special Legends Night episode. WWE Raw beat WWE SmackDown, which happened on Friday, in total audience for the first time in at least a year, maybe going back to before SmackDown was on the Fox Network. Monday Night Raw, the leading wrestling television program this week. 2.1 million viewers on average over the course of its three hours. The highest total audience actually since March 16th. The highest 18 to 49 audience since WrestleMania. SmackDown in its second week since having a huge lead in from an NFL game on Christmas Day did a totally normal rating of 2 million viewers. A normal .5 in the 1849 key demo. Meanwhile, on Wednesday, Wednesday night was dominated by ratings from the cable news networks, CNN, Fox, and MSNBC, following the riots at the Capitol earlier that day. AW Dynamite was down significantly from what it's been doing lately. Dynamite had three episodes in December that did more than 900,000 viewers. This episode doing just 662,000 viewers. That is the lowest viewership for Dynamite, both total audience and the key demo since June 24th, way back at late June 2020. NXT, however, not so affected. NXT was hit pretty hard last week, having to go up against uh, Dynamite with its tribute to Brody Lee. NXT was actually up from that episode last week, only down slightly compared to the two weeks prior. NXT with a total audience of 641,000, so just about 20,000 viewers short of what AEW did in the total audience. NXT delivering about 210,000 P18-49 to viewers compared to Dynamite's 320, so 210 to 320. This information, as always, courtesy of showbuzzdaily.com. A year-end analysis note, We'll do this just for Raw because Raw is the only like-to-like comparison between 2019 and 2020 in terms of it was on the same network for the entire year. That is not the case with SmackDown, Dynamite, or NXT, or even Impact for that matter. NXT and Dynamite only started in the fall of 2019. SmackDown started on Fox in the fall of 2019, but Raw was on the USA Network for the entirety of 2019 and 2020. Point is, the comparison between raw and non-news cable, we're going to exclude cable news, because cable news has done exceptionally well in 2020, but excluding the news channels, the three big news channels, cable overall, in total audience, down 16% year over year. 16% total audience. 18 to 49 audience, down 24%. So it's down 16%, down 24%. What did raw do in comparison to that? 
raw year over year, total audience down 22%. Again, non-news cable down 16%. So raw is down worse in total audience than cable overall, excluding the news. If we included the news, it would be even a worse disparity, a worse look for raw. 1849 audience for raw down 29%. 1849 audience for non-news cable, down 24%. So again, uh, total audience, negative 22% for raw, negative 16% for non-news cable. Negative 29% for raw in 1849 demo, negative 24% for non-news cable. These probably sound like just the recitation of numbers, but what does it mean? It means that raw has suffered worse than cable overall. I'm focusing on cable because all this data is extracted from Showbiz Daily. And I have extracted the data. Actually, Matt Schroeder has extracted for me the data from Showbiz Daily. And we have only the cable because that's the stuff that they put in the text on the web page itself. They do report broadcast as well, but that's reported only in the form of an image. And I have not yet figured out how to extract that data. And in fact, that data is only prime time. Anyway, I think this gives us, gives us a pretty good insight into what's happening when people have conversations about all tv is down i've spoken about that many times here just additional confirmation that raw seems to be doing worse than tv overall a greatly improved number however this week with legends night 2.1 million viewers compared to the 1.5 to 1.8 that they've been doing over the last four weeks the following weeks will show whether that special episode on this past Monday helped retain or encourage any viewers into the future. I think it'll be a hard read into Q1. Viewership is usually up a little bit versus Q4. Q4 is challenged by going against the NFL and it being a holiday time. But uh, if you look back at the Raw 25 episode back on January 22nd, 2018, that did a huge rating, uh, basically a 60% increase over what they had been doing in the prior four weeks. That episode was followed by a number of episodes of Raw that did better than the episodes before the Raw 25 special. And again, all of this is leading into Royal Rumble time and getting closer to WrestleMania time. But we'll, we'll certainly watch what Raw viewership does in the weeks to come. So that's enough about media companies like WWE and All Elite Wrestling for now. And we'll move on to talk about a live event company, New Japan Pro Wrestling. New Japan Pro Wrestling is still getting the majority of their revenue. But it looks like New Japan may be getting more into the media business. And, and by the way, why I make this distinction between New Japan being a live event business and the others being a media business, just to put it in some perspective. If New Japan had a TV deal only to the level of what AEW's current U.S. TV deal is, New Japan Pro Wrestling would almost double its annual revenues. Almost double. Because AEW's U.S. TV rights deal, we know, has an average annual value of about $44 million. And New Japan, in its last non-COVID fiscal year, made about $50 million in revenue overall over its entire, entire business. So during Wrestle Kingdom 15, in the broadcast on January 4th, there was a very short clip played that was toned in purple and had some uh, wrestling highlights and then had a text on the screen that says NJPW hits TV in America and UK soon. That follows Dave Meltzer's report from the previous day saying that New Japan was very close to an English language television deal. So it seems like an announcement will be made relatively soon. Just my opinion, it seems the likeliest Destination would be the Roku channel, uh, and probably not a linear TV cable network. Of course, New Japan previously was on Access, which is now the home of Impact Wrestling. New Japan left Access at the end of 2019. So Roku would add up to me because you're talking about uh, America and the UK, and the Roku channel is available in the U.S., the U.K., and Canada. So what is the Roku channel? It is one of what they call the FASTs, another another acronym, FAST, F-A-S-T, which stands for Free 
ad-supported streaming television. So the, the Roku channel is basically an app, which is free, which I'm going to try to pull up on my Apple TV now. I've been meaning to do, that, do this, and I uh, don't know if, if it's on Apple TV, but I'm about to find out. But it's a, a streaming app where you can watch movies on demand, and there also seems to be a linear element. Linear element, what does that mean? It basically means that there is a live TV stream. And it does not appear that there is a Roku app on Apple TV, but I understand you can airplay it if you if you happen to have an iPhone or iPad. Uh, other, other things that are in the FAST, F-A-S-T category are Philo and Tubi. I think Tubi is owned by Fox. But this would allow uh, people to reach uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling uh, on a wide basis if they chose to. I, I don't know that it's, it's the same value as being on a, on a cable network that is within people's cable systems and on the guide that people are scrolling through. This, If you're on a, on a, a network or a platform, I guess I'm more comfortable saying, like Roku, you really have to seek it out. And the likelihood of coming across it are far less. Yet, on the other hand, if you're you're on Roku, anybody can access you, as opposed to being on Access, which is only in some cable homes. So I'm not confident whether this is better or worse than being on a network like Access. But for all I know, they'll announce a set of linear TV cable network deals in the US and UK, but I would be surprised. But in India... New Japan put out a press release on the 7th saying that they do have a TV deal in India with Eurosport. Eurosport was formerly known as D-Sport, and it is a component of Discovery. Eurosport is currently airing Impact Wrestling as well. Uh, The the press release says that uh, broadcasts were slated to begin on the 9th, that is yesterday to my present, Uh, broadcasting January 9th, 2021 from 6 p.m. India Standard Time with weekly episodes to telegast every Saturday and Sunday at 6 p.m. onward. According to the press release, Eurosport India broadcasts across India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Maldives, Nepal, Afghanistan, and Bhutan. Uh, According to a pretty old article from 2018, that's the newest a uh, piece of information I can find from 2018. This says, this is from IndianTelevision.com. Says that D Sport was available in 110 million homes. There are about three uh, that that is in India. So I don't know if that includes the other regions as well at this point or not. But anyway, if if it's still in roughly 110 million homes, that's about a third of Indian homes. There's about three 300 million households in the country of India. So the thing about coverage, that's about a third for some frame of reference. That's roughly the portion of household coverage that a a network like Access has in the United States. In terms of revenue, I have no idea how much it might be worth, but India is a, for WB, is, is its second biggest TV market, surpassing the United Kingdom in recent years. So this could be the beginning of, of New Japan starting to bring in more media revenue. And New Japan also announced during night one of Wrestle Kingdom that they are introducing a new mobile game, Strong Spirits, that will be available on smartphones worldwide sometime this year. And there is a great video uh, featuring Tetsuya Naito and Bushi Road president Takaki Kidani seeming to reignite their feud and uh, as they introduced uh, this game with some great facial expressions from Kidani there. And then in the world of media rights fees, there's some news related to Major League Baseball this week that may help us understand the future value of wrestling uh, media rights fees, which now drive the majority of the revenue for both WWE, and AEW. In a report from Ken Rosenthal with The Athletic, this is from Friday, he writes, 
Major League Baseball, after negotiating significant increases in most of its recent contracts with Fox Sports and Turner, is bracing for a reduction on a deal it is nearing with ESPN, according to sources with knowledge of the situation, end quote. So I've heard some discussion about this already, uh, but let's read on. Uh, later on, uh, Rosenthal writes, quote, MLB's previous deal with ESPN was an eight-year, $5.6 billion contract. It's worth $700 million per year. The agreement under discussion would be for seven years and approximately $3.85 billion, reducing the average annual value to about $550 million per year. End quote. But are they providing the same amount of games for that amount of money? Let's read on here. Quote, the lower payout to MLB will stem in part from ESPN reducing the number of games it does not carry exclusively by more than half. The league might attempt to sell those games to other outlets. ESPN will retain Sunday Night Baseball and the Home Run Derby and continue to broadcast an undetermined number of postseason games, as reported uh, last month by the New York Post, end quote. So let's bring out the calculator here. Uh, it doesn't look like they're naming the actual number of games from one deal to the next, only characterizing about half. So average annual value of $700 million per year for the current contract down to $550 million per year. So 550 divided by 700 is about 79%. So that means it's about a 21% reduction in compensation. But as noted, the number of games will be reduced by about half. So we got 20% downgrade in compensation, 21%, and about a 50% reduction in the number of games. So it would seem to me that the number of games um, is a key to understanding this, at least in terms of the, what, what does this mean for the wider landscape? Because what ESPN will be paying per game will in fact be higher uh, true, less revenue for baseball, for Major League Baseball, for the league. But in terms of per hour of content being provided, an increase. So I think that muddies the water for whether or not this is a negative signal for speculating on the future value of wrestling sports rights fees, well, wrestling rights fees, or for other sports for that matter. Oh, and I know what you might be thinking. Well, maybe this indicates that uh, networks just want a little bit less content. Maybe they'll pay more per hour. And, and then finally, there will be a two hour instead of a three hour raw. Um, I would not expect that. There are so many ways in which this wrestling economy does not make intuitive sense. And that uh, will continue to be one of them, I think. A three hour raw instead of a two hour raw is a bad thing for wrestling. Uh, for the, well, it's a bad thing for the popularity of, of that program, Raw. And if this were a, a simpler world and a simpler media economy, it would make sense to do a two-hour Raw instead of a three-hour Raw. And I don't know, maybe things do get more complicated when you're in an environment where you've got a three-hour Raw and a two-hour NXT being bought by the same partner, by the way, in addition to a two-hour SmackDown over on Fox. And now AEW's out there on TNT as well, providing another two hours. They're going to come out with another program sometime in 2021. That's one hour. So does that mean in 2024 there will be a two-hour Raw instead of a three-hour Raw? Who knows? I would not get my hopes up, though. And back in October, I wrote about how there are three metrics that will determine the future of the pro wrestling business. And one of those is the, the P1849 daily rank. In other words, it's the position of your viewership relative to that of other programming even if your viewership is on the, is on the decline your rank among the others is important raw ranking really highly on mondays uh aw not quite as highly but ranking pretty high in the, in the top 10 usually in cable in the demo on wednesday nxt usually in the lower the lower area of the top 50 on cable on Wednesday. And SmackDown, uh, of course, is on broadcast on Friday nights, but is often the most viewed program uh, in primetime broadcast in the key demo. 
But anyway, your ranking relative to other programming, number two, the value of other sports properties, especially the second tier sports properties. So I would classify Major League Baseball as first tier, along with the NFL, NBA, and NHL. So we should watch, especially watch those closely and watch other sports that are not among those top four team sports closely, as well as the proportional delivery of your uh, hours of P1849 viewership. So Raw still making up almost the majority of that, partly due to its length of three hours. But these deals in in the uh, sports rights media, sports media rights world, we will continue to monitor as time goes on for any hints that they may tell us about what the future deals will be for uh, WWE and AEW, whose uh, negotiations will probably start sometime in 2022 next year. I can say next year now. With deals at least for WWE getting done maybe around the middle of 2023 and those deals expiring in the fall of 2024. Vince McMahon has filed a countersuit against former XFL commissioner Oliver Luck. Vince filed the suit Thursday in Connecticut federal court. Vince claims that Luck defied his orders when it came to hiring league personnel and said that Luck essentially abandoned his duties when the COVID-19 pandemic forced the league to suspend play in mid-March. Luck had earlier sued McMahon in April for wrongful termination just one week after Vince had fired him. Luck looking to recover $23.8 million that he claims Vince owes him. Vince claims that Luck did not listen to him when it came to signing NFL wide receiver Antonio Callaway. As you may remember, Vince emphasized that the XFL would include only, quote, quality football players with good character, end quote. Callaway had been suspended from the Browns for 10 games for violating the NFL's substance abuse policy and was suspended before that in 2017 after felony charges of credit card fraud. Callaway eventually had a knee injury before the season even started, and that resulted in the league having to pay him workers' comp. And this caused the XFL to be unable to fire him without paying the original signing bonus worth more than $120,000. Vince claims in the suit that Luck knowingly and deliberately deceived me repeatedly. Vince is looking to recover $572,792.10, which would pay for Callaway's contract and workers' compensation owed him, and Luck's personal compensation between March 14th and April 9th, the time during which Vince claims that Oliver Luck abandoned the XFL. Luck's attorneys told in an email to The Athletic that this is just an attempt for McMahon to deflect from the fact that he owes Oliver Luck $24 million dollars. Vince also had issues with Luck pursuing other players, including former Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver Martavius Bryant, who was banned from the university where his XFL team was playing because of a 2016 sexual assault charge. Vince also has uh, separate declarations confirming his accounts from former XFL president Jeffrey Pollock and Tampa Bay Vipers head coach Mark Tretzman. There was apparently additional drama between Vince and Oliver Luck over Johnny Manziel, a Heisman Trophy winner and quarterback who had a brief run with the Cleveland Browns. Manziel never played for the XFL, but there were reports that the XFL was looking at signing him. Lawsuit documents include a screenshot of a text message exchange between Vince and Oliver Luck, where Vince sends Oliver Luck a URL to a profootball.com article about Johnny Manziel possibly coming to the XFL. And Vince writes, quote, How long are you going to play this game, Oliver? You know, there's no chance in hell for Manziel to play for us. I will not change my mind. So what's your plan? It should be noted that no chance in hell is spelled by Vince in all caps. Coincidentally, no chance in hell is also the song title for the theme music that Vince McMahon has long made his entrance to at WWE events. I am not making this up. Uh, Luck responded by trying to explain that he was just milking the story to keep the XFL in the news. McMahon also claims that Luck left the Connecticut in the XFL headquarters, which is just down the street from the WB headquarters, on March 13th, and went back to his home in Indiana, 
Vince and Luck never had any more direct contact after that. And Luck did not show up for a number of video meetings after that point. Vince, by the way, is represented by attorney from KNL Gates. Gary McDivitt. And Q4 filings have been published by the Federal Election Commission at FEC.gov. Among the largest individual single contributions in the entire Q4 period was from Linda E. McMahon of Connecticut with a $10 million contribution to the pro-Trump super PAC America First Action Incorporated, a political action committee which Linda McMahon herself is, or I don't know, was the chair of. Linda McMahon contributed an additional $155,600 to other committees during Q4. The $10 million contribution to America First Action is by far her largest single contribution ever. Her total contributions to America First Action come to $15.7 million. Since 2016, she has contributed uh, an additional $7.7 million to other Trump uh, political action committees, bringing her total contributions to various Trump-affiliated political action committees to 23.3, well, 0.4, 23.4 million dollars. To be exact, 23 million three hundred eighty-five thousand and forty-four dollars, or just over 23 million dollars. Other especially large contributions from public figures who are associated with wrestling companies. Chris Jericho, also known as Chris Irvine, contributed. Certainly at least nineteen thousand two hundred dollars. Nineteen thousand two hundred with eight thousand six hundred and sixty going to the Trump campaign, five thousand seven hundred and forty going to the Republican National Committee, and four thousand eight hundred going to the Trump Make America Great Again committee. There are additional redundant entries in the FEC record under either Chris Jericho or Chris Irvine, but it looks like those could be errors. That made it appear that he may have been contributing as much as 38400 but it looks like it's probably half that, $19,200. It's worth knowing Jericho has made comments on Twitter casting doubt on the legitimacy of the presidential election. He has hosted multiple political candidates on his podcast, including Donald Trump Jr. and Andrew Yang, in a recent episode of his podcast touched on COVID-19 conspiracies and other conspiracies. He has also claimed publicly that he is not a political person. Shahid Khan, who is the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, various other businesses, and was instrumental in facilitating the startup of All Elite Wrestling. Uh, Shahid Khan is also the father of AEW President and CEO Tony Khan. Shahid Khan contributed $5,000 to the Senate Georgia Battleground Fund. Those contributions made in December to the pro- Republican Party, Joint Fundraising Committee. And you may be aware in the state of Georgia, there was a runoff for both U.S. Senate seats. And that election just happened this past Tuesday. Uh, people often ask if there are other records of contributions from various other people in the professional wrestling industry. Uh, there are a, a number of records from different people in major wrestling companies, most of them very small contributions uh, there are no contributions that I have seen that are new in, in 2020 that come from many of the, the key players or key executives in major wrestling companies who you may have in mind. Linda McMahon is a former WWE executive. She has no current corporate role with WWE. She and her family, though, obviously gained vast majority of their wealth from their success with their wrestling business. And Linda McMahon is mentioned in an article with CNBC this week. This article, published on Saturday, titled, Pro-Trump Dark Money Groups Organized the Rally That Led to Deadly Capitol Hill Riot. It's explaining that the rally that led to riots on Capitol Hill on Wednesday, the rally known as March to Save America, 
was largely organized by a group known as Women for America First. Women for America First has Facebook pages showing that they were calling on supporters to be part of what they described as a caravan to Washington for the event. Women for America First is an organization certified by the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. It is certified as a nonprofit that can engage in limited political activities, also known as a 501c4 group. These groups, the CNBC article notes, are known as dark money organizations because they do not publicly disclose who their donors are. So there's a lot of America First stuff happening here, which makes this confusing. There's, there's three America First named organizations here. So there's uh, Women for America First. That is chaired by someone named Amy Kramer. Kramer? Amy Kramer. So that's Women for America First. Then there's America First Action, which we've known for a long time, that Linda McMahon is the chairwoman of. And then there's a third organization, also chaired, by Linda McMahon, called America First Policies. America First Policies and Women for America First are both 501c4, basically dark money groups, that do not disclose who their donors are. America First Policies, in 2019, in a filing, disclosed that it raised over $30 million. America First Policies, a Linda McMahon organization, at least charity organization, did give $25,000 to women for America First. Women for America First, again, uh, organized the rally that led to the riot. So I guess follow the bouncing ball here. This really doesn't have anything to do, apparently. Maybe it does, but it doesn't, as far as the information that I'm looking at here today right now, this doesn't have anything to do with the America First Action Super PAC, the pro-Trump Super PAC, uh, except for they're they're all Trump-associated organizations. So America First Policies, a Linda McMahon chaired organization, gave $25 to another organization called Women for America First. Women for America First organized the rally. Rally led to the riots and the uh, breaking into the Capitol building. So that's what's happening there. Linda McMahon has not tweeted since December. December 16th. She has not made any other public statement that I'm aware of. So uh, why cover any of this stuff at all? It's too political. Well, these are public figures, especially in the case of Linda McMahon. Um, she is uh, a, a former candidate for U.S. Congress. She is a former executive of the biggest wrestling company in the world. So I think that makes it relevant to this program. She don- donated no small amount of money, tens of millions, $23 million to Trump alone. Her wealth that she's relying on to make those contributions, that money is from the wrestling business. She chaired the America First Action Super PAC, uh, which raised millions of more dollars. Why Jericho? The amount of money is not nearly (laughs) what Linda McMahon raised, but he is a public figure, and it is nearly $20,000. And he's had political guests on his podcast. He's made public comments about elections. And uh, this would be equally newsworthy if either of those people were supporting candidates from a different political party. It's especially newsworthy in a week where support for Donald Trump in particular put people over the edge to do the violent thing that they did on Wednesday. And I think if we want to live in a peaceful society that recognizes the truth, then who is on the side of a peaceful society and on the side of a truthful society and who is not and who is contributing tens of thousands or tens of millions of dollars to one or the other is worthy of being distinguished. These are polarizing days, but in hindsight, when there is less emotional involvement, which may be a very long time from now, it will be much more clear who is right and who is wrong. And there may be more for the heirs of WWE to inherit than just Class B shares. The early WrestleMania associations with Trump, even the millions of dollars the family donated to the Trump Foundation in the late 2000s, before he ran for president and ravaged the nation, might be excused. But Linda's support and association with Trump the politician will be an unwelcome inheritance, particularly for a chief brand officer who's exerted so much effort to put a smile on the face 
of a company that historically has had a marred image in culture. Maybe you could even excuse Linda's donations leading up to the 2016 election when it was just the rhetoric that was hateful. Maybe you could even excuse the plausible pay-to-play appointment of Linda McMahon to the president's cabinet as small business administrator. An appointment made in 2017. But Linda's support only grew in the lead-up to the 2020 election. With Trump in denial of a pandemic, inflaming social tensions, and our epistemological crisis on a daily basis. She chaired the pro-Trump super PAC, America First Action. She raised and herself contributed millions of dollars to his re-election efforts. In hindsight, not next month or next year, but years from now, the Trump years will be memorialized in documentaries and books as the darkest times in the lives of most Americans who lived through them. And maybe there are more dark years still to come. There's a great deal of polarization today. About a third of the country is bound to their grievance they feel he represents. But for now, much to the contrary of some of the well-intentioned rhetoric, this is who we are. Seeing the faces of the people who were in Washington, D.C., on Wednesday, seeing the things that they were expressing and how they were expressing it. I feel like I grew up with those people. I grew up in one of the whitest suburbs uh, between Buffalo and Niagara Falls. I saw those people there. I saw them at school and later in the military. I saw those people in my own family. I still do. We are prone to conspiracies and cynical thinking, prone to a story that makes us the victim and absolves us from blame. That was the case before there was any social media or smartphones. We were primed to be this way, just waiting for the right set of circumstances. But I don't know if things are going to get better or if they're going to get a lot worse and the, the flood of information that will allow us to believe whatever feels good in the short term to believe, and the economic incentives of the ad economy seem greatly opposed to healing. So, I haven't got much more. Oh, by the way, WWE announced this past week that they will be doing an India superstar spectacle seeming to confirm what John Pollock and I reported about an India program, perhaps even an NXT India program sometime uh, happening in 2021, but certainly an India superstar spectacle, W announced, is on its way. And that will be airing on 10 Sports. But I continue to work on the 2020 full year report. Hopefully I'll get that out sometime around the end of the month. I've been uh, creating timelines and just been collecting a lot of the data, collecting the YouTube view data this week, collecting social media follower data. I've got Google web search data in here already. I've got uh, a net promoter score, I can now say, will be making its debut in the report with an original survey with uh, a more random sample than I have uh, surveyed in the past. Surveying not just people who follow WrestleNomics or or who are willing to share the WrestleNomics survey for me, but collecting responses exclusively through a Facebook ad. There may have been some organic sharing uh, secondary to that ad, but that was the primary way that over 500 responses were collected among uh, major English-speaking countries. So the results of that will be coming up in the full-year report. I think there's a lot of really... Uh, interesting information to be gotten from those results but I continue to to work on the report it's up to 30 pages right now it's, it's probably gonna, gonna be quite longer than that I haven't even started really writing any uh, any insight opinion stuff for that yet just collecting the facts still so thanks to the place to be nation main event podcast for having me on as a guest and the pro wrestling illustrated PWI podcast for having me on as guest this week also. 
And I was on in the United Kingdom with Alex and Will of TalkSport. I think I was on, like, terrestrial radio in the United Kingdom. For a brief, like, ten minutes. I don't know if it was even ten minutes. I don't know. For a segment. So you can check that all out if you just can't get enough of WrestleNomics Talk. If you think this program is so good that uh, you want to pay for it, go to patreon.com slash WrestleNomics. All the patrons will be getting the full year 2020 report when it's done as part of their monthly support. $5 a month. Patreon.com slash WrestleNomics. You can follow WrestleNomics everywhere at WrestleNomics, including Twitter, if your account still exists. You can follow me at Brandon Thurston. And I'm Brandon Thurston. I will talk to you next time.